Hi, everybody. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are starting to look at what we will refer to as archaic homo or the members of our genus that, that either precede us directly, uh, like some species of pre-modern humans, and some of the species we know are actually distinct species like Homo neanderthalensis. I'm going to break this up into two sections. The first is going to be an introduction to archaic or pre-modern uh, species like Homo heidelbergensis, and the second will be um, Homo neanderthalensis. So before we get into this, I do of course wanna start with an important discussion about climate because the Pleistocene period, which is supposed to say 1.8 million years ago to about 11,000 years ago, is a period of time where we have uh, glaciations, fluctuations in um, climate that are quite dramatic because glacier events mean that glaciers are getting larger, which means that the water in the ocean is getting locked up inside of them, which means that more land mass is going to be visible. Um, and interglacial periods where those glaciers are melting are, of course, going to do the opposite. They're going to inundate land with the water that's melting from those glaciers and make less land available. Um, these glaciations and these, these uh, changes in temperature and climate um, and surface, really, are going to be very important for our discussion this week because they are also impacting the overall climate around the world. Um, so notice, for instance, um, what the climate in Africa looks like during an interglacial, interglacial period when there are uh, glaciers melting. You see that the climate is a little bit more wet, there's increased rainfall, there's a lot more um, green land, forestry, et cetera. But in a glacial period, when all of that water is kind of locked up in the glaciers and it's cold, uh, even colder in the north, we get a lot drier temperatures in Africa. And this is going to be similar in other areas of the world, but very important for our discussion is the fact that the rising and lowering of the water levels as a result of glacial and interglacial periods are going to open and close migratory routes for humans to get out of Africa. And um, the reason this is so important to our discussion at this time is because um, this may be the first time in human history where as a result of these closed off migration routes, species of archaic, you know, archaic species were then isolated long enough in other areas of the world, like Asia and Europe, that there was enough uh, mutation accumulation for there to be speciation. We know this occurred because there are a handful of species that are recent enough that we can synthesize their DNA, and we know that we mated with them. One of them is going to be Homo neanderthalensis. Um, and we know that they were distinct species because of their DNA, excuse me. So um, in order for this to happen, we have to have this isolation. Prior to this, it's very difficult, as, as you saw in our, our Homo genus lecture with Homo habilis and Homo erectus, to say whether or not those were actually distinct species because the DNA is a little bit too old to be synthesized. Um, but we know with certainty now as we're moving forward, we can say that there are species that we are related to, we share a common ancestor with, and we mated with. Um, those species were able to speciate probably because of these migration shifts. So the first part I want to talk about um, is a species named Homo heidelbergensis, um, sometimes referred to as archaic Homo sapiens or pre-modern Homo sapiens, but we're going to use the phrase or the, uh, the species name Homo heidelbergensis. Um, this species was named after its location uh, where it was first found in 1907, Heidelberg, Germany. The fossil record shows evidence of this species between 600 and 300,000 years ago in Africa and around the world. Um, the molecular evidence suggests that the species must have evolved earlier, maybe even as early as 1 million years ago, but we don't have the fossil evidence to support that. Now, what's fascinating about Homo heidelbergensis and the knowing that we can synthesize genomes, not quite as early as Homo heidelbergensis, but um, the other species here, Denisovan, Neanderthal, et cetera, 
is that we believe that Homo heidelbergensis may have evolved in multiple directions. Um, Homo heidelbergensis that may have been isolated in Asia, um, particularly the area of Tibet um, and high altitude regions may have evolved into a species named Homo denisovan. Um, Homo heidelbergensis that got trapped and isolated in Arctic Europe may have evolved to Homo neanderthal, whereas Homo heidelbergensis in Africa may have evolved into Homo sapiens. You'll notice we have another little branch here. There is some molecular evidence of a, a fourth species on this, uh, this little tree here, but we don't have any fossil evidence for it, so it's yet to be named. Now, Homo heidelbergensis um, is a transitionary species, meaning that they're going to have some of those primitive traits left over from Homo erectus, like the sloping forehead behind a projected brow ridge um, and that long, low brain case with a thick cranium. But they're also developing more advancing traits, including a big increase in brain size, about 1,250 cubic centimeter brain average among the fossil samples of this species with a couple additional changes. The frontal lobe and the parietal lobes of the brain appear to be enlarging among this species as well. And the frontal lobe is going to be very, very important to higher order thought. So it may explain why we start to see an increased advancement of culture and technology among this species and its predecessors. This species was also taller than Homo erectus um, with a much more rounded braid case <clears throat> and a cranial breadth that was wider. So the brain is getting larger, it's getting wider at its base. This is the first time we're seeing a clear vertical nose similar to ourselves, that's forward facing, but also a relatively wide nose. The teeth are also smaller and more delicate over time. It's likely that we are definitely cooking food by the time we reach this age in human evolution. And that really would not have um, selected for the big features of the face where muscular attachment is occurring in order to grind and, and tear and shred. If we cook our foods, if we break them down, we just need a lighter, delicate jaw. And then we can use more of that cranial surface for the size of the brain. Now this species is taller, longer legs than Homo erectus, which would give them an increased efficiency in long distance travel, but still robust, um, still heavier than we're going to see in Homo sapiens later. Now, just to give you an idea, I have our samples. We have our Paranthropus here, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo heidelbergensis, Notice the, uh, the more delicate teeth and the fully vertical nose comparatively to our Homo erectus that's still slightly slanted. Now we have a nice thick brow ridge here, but look at the sheer vault of this cranium. It's significantly larger. And the delicate cheekbones are also indicative of our advancing traits. Looking from the side, you can see a little bit of more of what I'm talking about here in terms of our cranial volume, much larger, wider skull. We're seeing widening here as well. And you can get a sense of that vertical nose, fully forward facing. The side of the skull gives you kind of an indication of that slope as well. Instead of sloping behind the eye, going behind the eye and then sloping upwards, um, the full cranium is kind of uh, in line with the top of the brow ridge here. We are increasing the volume of the skull overall. And notice a flat face with that forward facing nose. In Homo erectus, we still have a slight angle to the face. Much smaller, of course, than our Paranthropus angle, but still an angle nonetheless. A few samples. Um, the Bodo cranium is our oldest Homo heidelbergensis sample, 600,000 years old, discovered in 1976. The cranial size is large, 1,250 uh, cubic centimeters, but it still has a, a thick cranium um, and kind of broad skull similar to that of Homo erectus, which we would expect of the earliest members of this genus, um, excuse me, of this species. 
to be a little bit primitive, but also advancing in terms of brain size. Um, now, what's interesting culturally speaking about the botocranium is that there are clear um, signals. So you can see some of the cut marks here uh, where a blade was used to remove the flesh from this skull. Now, what that means is up for debate. Um, is it ritualistic cannibalism? Is it just simply, you know, eating these people to survive? I mean, it is a food source, right? But um, the modern ethnographic record does show cultures that do cannibalize historically for religious reasons, for reasons of warfare. Um, and so we're moving to a point in human history where we can start to make speculations about behavior by looking at what's left behind. The cobway cranium is another African example. This one is uh, 300 to about 200,000 years old from Zambia. Um, note again, very robust, robust brow ridges of the ancestors, but the cranium is thinner and it's larger than Homo erectus, much similar, much more similar to Homo sapiens. Brain size is quite large as well. And there's significant tooth decay, which implies that this individual is, um, there. we're starting to live longer, long enough that our teeth are starting to decay, they're starting to fall out, we're living into our elderly ages. One last example, and this one's very important. This is the Steinheim cranium. Um, it's about 350,000 years old, found in Germany, um, 1,100 cubic centimeters. So a smaller brain size on average, but an interesting example that appears perhaps to be already along the line of Homo neanderthalensis. Um, a significantly rounded brain case. This wide nasal cavity is going to be a distinctive trait of Homo uh, neanderthalensis later, as well as a depression in the occipital area, which is actually the rear of the skull right here. When we get to Neanderthals here in a moment, you'll see that they have a depression or something you can kind of press your thumb into at the base of their skull um, in the back. And this is a distinctive trait for them. So um, the Steinheim cranium shows that perhaps um, 350,000 years ago, we already have individual archaic um, members of the Homo genus that are starting to collect these Neanderthal-like traits. Now, what was the lifestyle and culture like? I don't ask you about Homo heidelbergensis on your chart, only because there's so much controversy about are they a real species, um, you know, and 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 because they have such great variation depending on where you find them in the world. But for the sake of knowledge and for your quizzes, uh, do know that this species uh, does have some significant advancements. Um, we're seeing a lot more evidence of uh, sedentary living. So living in caves and some open air sites as well. Chinese archeologists um, insist that in middle Pleistocene sites, um, there is significant evidence of human controlled fire as well as clear butchering locations, um, which would indicate, you know, actually at the bottom, I should switch this up here, um, a patterned butchery technique. So the leftovers, the remnants found in these caves appear to indicate that Homo heidelbergensis had a pattern with which they would butcher their meat. They hunted large game. They were the first to utilize spears. Um, and compound tools with spears in order to hunt animals, very different. We haven't seen this yet. Homo erectus may have ran them down, um, but certainly didn't have any weapons that appeared to be valuable in terms of hunting. So this is all new and it's a lot more nutrition for the brain, a lot more uh, cultural patterning that appears to be being passed down from generation to generation. There's even some possible uh, furniture seabed stone blocks that appear that they may have been used um, in home sites, uh, like within a cave. There also are a few very controversial examples of burials with stone axes. Um, a cave in Aropuerca, Spain, um, shows uh, an area where Homo heidelbergensis bodies appeared to be dropped into this cave from an inlet at the top, um, and that one of them may have been sent in with a pink quartz hand axe. 
um, a hand axe that doesn't necessarily have a utilitarian value to it. Um, and instead may have just been a representation of that person symbolically. We're gonna speculate a lot about burials moving forward because they may be um, uh, some evidence of some increased cognitive capacities in some uh, increased cultural changes and norms like the development of religion and the development of ritualized behavior, the development of individual symbolism and language um, are all gonna be a part of uh, the symbolism of burials and uh, tool technology. So certainly some, some big changes happening here. An intelligent species with greater cognitive capacity, planning, patterning, and cultural innovation that we haven't quite seen yet. Um, in the next section, we're going to be introduced to Homo neanderthalensis, which is one of the species that Heidelbergensis may in fact have evolved into. Um, I will see you back here in just a moment for that section.